and I've been with the Steelworkers Union for almost 20 months now. I'm really looking forward to my two-year anniversary. Um, it's you been get a, a pay raise? What's that? Did you get a pay raise? Well, I'm lucky to have a job right now with the way <laughs> things are. You know, and that's the thing, with, with the way the economy is, uh, with the way jobs have been getting depleted all across the country, uh, we have not weathered the storm, you know, we, we, are, we are a struggling organization just like any other. We've lost hundreds of thousands of members, and there's no time more important, more important than right now for us to stand up and fight and to make sure that we're protecting these jobs, that we're bringing jobs back to America. There, there's no way that uh, this stimulus package that's coming down is going to be for the benefit of America unless people like us are standing up and saying, we want jobs, we want health care, we want um, you know, infrastructure built, we want a new source of energy yeah. that's going to create jobs. So that's, that's our task as a union. Instead and opposed to giving everybody $500 to go to Walmart <laughs> and spend shit made, spend for stuff making in China. <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, so this, this tool, though, this phone bank, um, the great thing about it is that this has been a center point of our political organizing structure, of our political program here in the Steelworkers Union. Uh, and, so, and so now that it's, it's an operating function, it was a centerpiece of our program, we want to use this as a way to build alliances, to, to continuously communicate with our members, to grow and to mobilize around this new stimulus package, the economic renewal that's going to be occurring. So, so this is kind of going to be, be the hub of our operations uh, and be something that may, may, maybe other groups can partner with us and use. So I'm going to kind of just talk about how we use this during the election and um, hopefully that gives you an understanding of what a resource this is. So the phone banking, uh, you are in our call center. But first I wanted to just say what the components of our political program was. Uh, or were, I guess I should say. There were basically four pieces to our political program. We are our, our this is our international headquarters here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We represent um, 700,000 members across the United States, 1.2 million if you, if you include our members in Canada, um, active and retired members. This is the centralized location that coordinates all of our operations across the country. So it's, Wayne, what, what's the word that you like to use? It's the, uh, the hub or the, I have it here. I think it's a good clearing house. The clearing house. Yes. We are not the operation, but we're the clearing house that kind of, you know, controls the apparatus. So our program ac across the country in this election cycle was four pieces. Okay, our leaflets and <coughs> leaflets program, leaflet leafleting locals all across the country, um, or pamphlets. This can be something that a lot of organizations do, getting out to members, getting out to the people that comprise that group. Uh, so we had an expansive leaflet program that helped educate our members, get them registered to vote, get them educated on the candidates that were running for office at the federal at the state level. Um, the second piece is mail. Okay, Mail is a very expensive thing to manage, but it's, it's, often, it's very irreplaceable. I mean, it's a very good way to communicate with members. You, you can get a lengthy message out in mail, and, and that continues and probably always will be part of our program. And that could be email and snail mail. We have both components in our program. Um, the next one is door-to-door -door canvassing. You've probably all done it if you worked in a campaign or if you've even done some issue work. You know, door-to-door -door canvassing is, is the third piece. And then finally, what I'm going to talk about is phone banking. <coughs> um, this is not your traditional phone bank. You know, if you go into a phone bank, you're often seeing hand-dialed phones. You have to dial each call. And you have to manage with you know all of the hang-ups and answering machines and busy signals and all that stuff. This system is much more advanced. Um, the system dials the phone numbers for you. Uh, you do get answering machines. We can we can follow them out if we want. Uh, what what we often did during the campaign was we would do live calls, and if you got an answering machine, we would go back later and hit that with a robocall. So we weren't hitting a live person with a robocall. We were going back and hitting the answering machine that we just did. <laughs> So it was a good way that no matter what, we were, we were penetrating our list to the best of our ability. Um, so that's kind of how we did it. And so that's the piece that I'm going to talk about today. So this is a 30-station predictive dialer. There are 30 stations here. There's on-screen scripting, meaning that we have a very fluid script that you can manage. You can collect data. Um, and the data collection is re really the other piece, other than just the call capacity that we put out, but actually being able to collect the data in a uniform way 
that we use to fuel our political program and to, uh, to better understand our members. And we could do that very, very quickly. It was very, so it was rather than going into a, con a congressional district blind, we had all the information going in. We were able to learn from it, improve our skills, improve our strategy, and change. And that's what that's how we're going to grow our program and have a better political operation. We also have ten remote stations. Now, all of these phones are voice over IP. It's internet phone lines. It's not traditional phone lines. And all of our district offices across the country have those same operating systems. So this dialer, we had ten remote stations where we actually had laptop computers in Nashville, Tennessee. We moved into Menasha, Wisconsin. So just this last week, we had a campaign in Nashville, Tennessee, where they used ten lines from our dialer with laptops in Nashville, Tennessee, to call steel workers in Nashville. So that's kind of a cool thing that we've, we've been able to advance. The other thing is robocall capacities, uh, something that you brought up. We have, done, we have done a number of different robocalls. We've done simple messaging where it's just a simple message going out about an issue or a candidate or remember, uh, reminding you, hey, tomorrow's election day, go out and vote, and we're asking you to support this candidate. We also, we've also done push surveys where it's a uh, multiple question survey and it's audible and you know, the person can push one or two to answer however uh, they wish to respond to that question. Okay? But th honestly, the most effective interactive robocall that we've used was a petition. Okay? And our most recent petition was for the Employee Free Choice Act. And this petition call went out to all of our members across the country. And it ended up we had 36,000 signatures through this robocall, okay? And that was just asking if the member wanted to sign the petition, they just pushed one, and that registered as a signature. If they wanted to hear more about it, they would just push two, and we had like a 20-second blurb about the Employee Free Choice Act. And then at the end of that explanation, they had the opportunity to push one again, okay? So it's not only um, a petition signing, but it's also an educational piece and it was able to get, to get out to all of our members. Um, my three words at the beginning, whenever I said my name, were people-powered politics. And I think that really, there's not too many other ways that we do politics um, th that were more effective and more useful than what we did here in the phone bank. It essentially is political power because, because we're able to communicate with people on a mass level more, more than we can in any other fashion in, in terms of time frame. These numbers here, this is just comparing live phone banking to phone banking in a predictive dialer. And these are numbers from, we compared what was going on. The AFL-CIO had a, a live hand dialer downstairs during the election cycle. We got an average of how many calls they could do an hour, and we averaged it and compared it to what we did here. And it, it, it increased our output by at least 61% for persuasion or survey calls. And for get out the vote calls, um, it, it was again, again over double. So during, you know, if we have 30 people in these stations, we were able to do about 300 surveys an hour, and that's like a five to 10 question survey. Or if it was get out the vote calls, we were doing five to 600 get out the vote calls every single hour. And that's not dials, that's conversations. That's voter contacts, okay, actual conversations with live people. Um, with the robocalling, we have the capa capacity. We do, during the election, we had the capacity to do up to 4,000 pre-recorded messages per hour. We could get out that many messages across the country. Um, right now, we've scaled down a little bit, and we're able to do about half that. But we always have the capacity to up it. Okay. What does predictive dialing mean? Predictive dialing just means that the computer's dialing it. That's all it is. Yeah. Um, just, so just to just to clarify that a little bit. Your organization has a database of its members. If you want to get this, if you wanted to ask the USW to make these calls for us, you would get that file, that Excel file, and we would load it up here, and, and even your organization can come in and make those calls to those folks as volunteers. So the, the, the numbers are already pre-known, and they're coming from a file, whether it's our file, whether it's a candidate's file, whether it's an organization file. That's all it takes to get this done here. That's why they call it predictive dialing. You know the numbers that you're going to call, and all you do is load them up, and the computer does it. And, and the doubling essentially comes from the fact that you just got people picking up real 
people. Yeah. Computers handling all the dialing and yep. hang ups or not answers, busies, all that. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of being predictive, one, one thing I, uh, I've got asked before is is it completely random? And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, we have the capacity with our membership file, okay, like I said, 700,000 members um, across the US or more. Basically, we were able to do, let's say we had a rally coming up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're able to pull a 30 or 40 mile radius, just draw a circle around it, pull out all of the zip codes and phone numbers for our members in that area, upload the file, and in half an hour, we're calling all of our members in a 30 to 40 mile radius in Pittsburgh. So if you've got a congressman that's going to go wrong on an issue, all right, we want to put pressure on them, we can pull all of our members within that area or, or any other group. If, if you have phone numbers for all your, all of your members or constituents in Pittsburgh, you upload the file, and within half an hour, we're ready to call all of the members to mobilize them, to educate them, to put pressure on the selected official. So, I mean, it's a great, it's a great tool. And, you know, you look at this map, you say, so many states, so, many little, so, so little time, how do you manage this? What do you possibly do? And so this is, you know, having this capacity, we were able to manage that, that map. And so, basically what we did, um, for the 2008 election cycle, for April th through July, you know, we actually worked all throughout the uh, January Iowa, Iowa caucuses, but this is, this is presidential election time, this is not primary time, um, that I'm just going to talk about. April through July was our message development, our campaign strategy, developing our campaign, our political program. Um, the next phase was education and outreach, and then get out the vote. Now you'll see these numbers here. This is number of calls, number of contacts per month. And from April until November, we spoke to over 118,000 union members across the country, somewhere in the country, okay, in that time frame. Now, if you go back a year from then, um, the number is, is actually around 700,000 live contacts in the last year, in the last 18 months, I should say, since I started. Um, and the number of robocalls is around 2.5 to 3 million robocalls. Okay, so that's maybe three three robocalls for every member in the last year and a half. Okay, so that's kind of an idea of what we what we did through our through our dialer. Um, so the first stage was message development strategy, April through July, and so we took the 50 state map, and we drew it down to where we had member density that we wanted, and, and in states that were going to be competitive in the election. So all the states in gray were states that we started doing surveying. Um, it was a nonpartisan survey about jobs, the economy, and health care, and other issues. We were fo focusing on better understanding our members at the time. This was ramping up for the election to better understand the concerns that they had. Um, we started testing messages, you, you know, depending on the uh, concerns that were being most voiced by members. Uh, testing messages to see what was most effective, what they wanted to hear more, and that way we were, we were better understanding their concerns and also talking about them in the election cycle. And then finally, we were, we were doing state-by-state -state polling. At this time, we did not have an endorsement in, in the presidential election. John Edwards had dropped out of the race. Uh, we were still dancing between Clinton and Obama. And at this time, it was all about better understanding our members. And so we were doing state-by-state -state polling, seeing where the candidates were at, and also how involved our members were going to be in this presidential election. So once we made an endorsement for Barack Obama and felt that we had a firm understanding of the concerns of our members, we started rolling out leaflets and flyers and letters that had been crafted in response to what we were hearing from our members on the phone. So we had members that wanted to hear about uh, retired Americans issues, you know, health care, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, pensions, benefits. We uh, had, had a member from, or a letter from uh, President Gerard. You can't, really, you can't read it here, but addressing all the issues that, the, that members were concerned about, talking about Barack Obama. Um, this is a local union president, this one down here in the bottom, I guess your right corner, uh, talking about why he supported Barack Obama 
and how his local had been affected by job loss throughout the Bush administration. So we started tailoring the messages to what we were hearing on the phones. And these leaflets were targeted to the state and local level. It wasn't just a general message all across the country, but we started to target. We had flyers like this that had local union presidents from uh, different local union presidents all across the country. So they had the face of the local union president on it, okay, and they could identify with it. Um, and again, that was all through what we learned on the phone bank. Did you guys stay out of the primary? Did we stay out of the primary? Not endorse a candidate in the primary. We endorsed Obama. John Edwards. Yeah, we endorsed Edwards. Till. Um, the but then time. he dropped out, of course. And then we, when did we endorse Obama? We did not endorse in the Pennsylvania primary, if that's your question. Yeah. Yeah. We endorsed after Pennsylvania's primary. Um, because, quite frankly, the polling that we did in Eric, yeah. I mean, it was right oh, down the yeah, pipe. Was, yeah, there was no way to make... I bet you it might have yeah. been more the other more It was time. closer than I've ever seen it between two candidates, anyway. So what we did the next phase um, during this education and outreach, we, again, narrowed our states, took it down to the states that we, we thought were going to be most competitive in the election, and also knew where we had the most membership density, the, be the best capacity to mobilize, to um, have, you know, earn media events, and, and to really be competitive with our membership. Um, so these were the states that we focused in on in black, so we narrowed our scope, and we began using the messages that we found most effective. Okay, so from the previous, the previous stage, we were testing those messages. In these states is where we started to move and apply these messages to hopefully pull members on board to um, introduce them and better inform them about, about Barack Obama and what, what he stood for and what he was going to do for jobs and health care and worker rights in America. Uh, the next phase, we started doing our massive get out the vote effort. Uh, now, in those previous two stages, okay, that's, what was it, 70 some thousand <coughs> calls, live contacts. We were using that information to better understand our strengths and weaknesses in throughout these states. To model our membership, to say, okay, these are where we should be focusing our calls in the last days of the election, to get out the vote and make sure that we have the biggest presence we can on election day. So on the last days of the election, the month and a half leading up to the election, we really ramped it up. We started, we had a much shorter script that was something like 30 seconds to maybe two minutes of conversation with a member, where we're talking about the candidate, trying to use our most persuasive points, and really, uh, you know, have the, have the call as least conversation as, as possible so that we could reach out to as many members as possible in those last days. And in that last month and a half, we had over 30,000 live contacts. But we focused it on the states and the areas in those states that were most needed to win on Election Day. Um, and we did that through modeling. With the AFL-CIO, they do a lot of modeling to best understand what parts of the states we needed to be calling. And, and we really rolled into the AFL-CIO's program, where we were calling in the last days, it was really Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, the states, the states that we knew we had to secure to win on November the 4th. Um, and if you look at it, you know, the thing about it is that we have in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Indiana, in Michigan, literally in each of those states, the Steelworkers Union has over 100,000 members in every state, okay? Now, if you take that and you multiply it by a spouse, because often, more often than not, you vote the same way your spouse does, okay? So you take those 100,000, you multiply it by another 100,000. You're talking about 200,000 votes. But then you start talking about their voting age children. You start talking about their friends and, the, and, and coworkers in their workplace. You're, you're literally talking about hundreds and thousands of votes, if not millions, in these very contested states. And that's how we had a presence as a union, as an organization, and as you know, a membership-based, issue-based or uh, organization. So that's how we were a force. You know, like I said, people powered politics. It's people that power politics. And so that, that was our bargaining chip on election day. And that's how we uh, foresee holding them, you know, th these now elected officials accountable with this new stimulus package or with health care or with whatever issue um, we look to move forward on. This is our bargaining chip and this is how we did it. 
So what were we doing in each of these states? You know, I said Ohio was one of them. For example, this was our polling number from 926 until 1022, okay? These were daily tracking scores. We were, we were pulling samples, okay? People were making the calls. We were talking very briefly about the candidates and we were seeing where we were every single day or, or as often as we could. So we have here leaning for Obama, supporting Obama, undecided, leaning for McCain, supporting McCain. And every day we were able to see where our members were, okay? And often, oftentimes we were able to change this by congressional district because of the, the fluidness of our, of, our, of our phone list and our uh, database. So we're able to do this within congressional districts, not just the state in general, but we're talking congressional districts. Before we had this resource, we would have paid pollsters and other groups hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this type of, of research and learn what we did about our members in this election cycle. And this was not a functioning room, literally, until probably this election cycle. Wayne can probably speak about it from the last election cycle. It wasn't functioning the way it was in this election cycle. And it's because we staffed up, we invested in software that was going to be useful, and literally, you know, because of the phone, the phone bankers that we had, you know, they just came in, they tore it up, they loved it, and they loved working on it, and we were able to learn more than we ever had in the past. So that was Ohio and what we did in Ohio. Now, we broke it down, though, in Pennsylvania. We, we took it from the presidential election, but we also, also started looking at some of these congressional races. So, for example, up in PACD3, we were looking at Kathy Dahlkemper, uh, she was running against Phil English. So we were not doing just the presidential election, but also as, asking who they were going to support um, for the congressional race, all right? And same thing, we were having daily tracking or weekly at, at, at worst case scenario. <coughs> then we were down uh, with CD4, which was Jason Altmaier, and then over in the Philadelphia area, we were just focusing, because we have a lot of members in Philadelphia, um, on the presidential race. So we were breaking it down within congressional districts and learning where we needed to staff up, increase our output of leaflets, where we needed to have uh, earned media events. If we were struggling in CD4 but doing well in Philadelphia, you know, we were able to maneuver our program and adapt it to what was going on amongst our members. And, and we knew that because of this phone bag and because of the calls that we were making. But now, did you have Altmaier Hart on that Western Pennsylvania, th or just Obama? Oh no, that was the uh, the Altmaier Hart question was certainly part of the call. Yeah, I mean we were asking who are you supporting for president, and also there's an important congressional race between Melissa Hart and Jason Altmaier, who you're supporting there. So yeah, it was part of the call. So. We had a particularly heavy load in Pennsylvania, a couple of which we didn't plan on. We certainly needed to protect the four freshmen that were elected in those six. We had an opportunity in CD3 with Kathy Dahlkemper against Phil English, and we got the, you know, we had to protect the race out east, the kanjorski barletta race that we didn't think we had to. And if you remember, there was a stage about one week before Election Day where we had to come to John Murtha's defense. So we started out with four races and ended up covering half the congressional delegation in Pennsylvania. Uh, and our polling. That, that anytime anything happened, Eric, in all, in addition to all of this, this, these calls that he made on behalf of Obama, and trying to find out where members' opinions were, and he had us a bit of a political shop, asking him to run flash polls in certain counties, congressional districts, things like that, so that we knew what was happening in these congressional races too, because they were all our responsibilities too. And you'll see around the room, you'll see the, where, you know, the, the, we actually had the Congress people that we were helping out, we actually had them call into this room so that the people that we were using in the phone bank were actually would get to know them or get an idea of exactly, you know, who they were espousing for, so to speak. And, uh, but in addition to everything that we did with the polling and the surveying and the stuff like that, we did all of these congressional races. We had a lot of freshmen that were elected, I think 35. Or 39 in 2006, we protected every one of those races that were worth protecting. And in addition to all the, the races that, that arose, 
plus the, the Senate races we did, plus the presidential race, and we did them all from this room with his dollar. And again, this, this was all United Steelworker members. All this is all within your organization. Well, last you, you didn't do any public calling, of, did you? Or? No, no, we could do public calling. And Eric, I'll let you go. Eric, this is no, your gig, no, man. No. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I mean, he was public, probably going to answer you know, as, long as, way, you, so. as long as you didn't get into persuasion calls, mm -hmm. as long as you did not say, vote for, we could do the calls. As long as we did not say, vote for. You could, if you could, if you could, let's say, put your script together. You could do what you, you could, a you could walk on that line or walk up next to that line, let's say. But as long as you didn't say vote for, let's say, Doll Kemper, you were okay. Because that's your and, organization. Is the way and we it's had done. many organizations drop their files off here that we made calls for. Believe me, uh, we I know that we did calls for we did a robocall up in. CD3 for the SEIU. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we Burger. Uh, Anna Burger re recorded a, a robocall that we ran for her up there. All we needed was the file, which are members. Okay. We did call the land in the van, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, I mean, there's we could a call perfect, both. Uh, a perfect example of what we could do outside of our membership. You know, we had a relationship with a woman named... Uh, Jill Long Thompson, sorry, uh, who is running for governor in the state of Indiana. Okay, in the state of Indiana, campaign laws are much more lax than in a, in a, in a lot of other states. We we were able to do in kind work, in kind work, not an actual exchange of money, with a candidate for any amount that you can imagine. Okay, because of the way the campaign finance laws are structured. Now. So in the state of Indiana, they were, they were able to provide um, a general voter file list. Jill Long Thompson recorded the, recorded the call, and they, they were able to go through in kind, through our dialer, all legal, on the, all on the books, and do calls to the general voter file in, in Indiana, in the state of Indiana. So I mean, those, those same things are, are possible in other states. And now that we have this apparatus and we understand how it works, and we can use it to the effectiveness that we've used it, we are now at the point where where we're ready to reach out to other groups and say, how do you want to use this? Because this can seriously be an animal. I mean, whenever we, I was talking to Wayne earlier about how useful this is. In the presidential race, it was useful. But if you really want to talk about how it was useful, you need to go into the congressional districts where we did some work. That's where you can really see the effectiveness. Because what we did, and, and what I was going to talk about, is in these, in these congressional districts, the perfect example is what uh, we did with Kathy Dahlkemper. Uh, Phil English had been a congressman in CD3 since 2003. Before him, it had been Tom Ridge. Phil was in there for, for seven than terms, that. 14 years. Yeah, longer than that. Well, my number's so wrong, then. It's 1994, I believe. Yeah, it looks like he was there for And he was preceded by Tom Ridge. Yeah, Tom Ridge before that, and Tom Ridge had been in there since 1983, okay? So, I mean, this, this had been a Republican seat for as long as I've been alive, okay? And the interesting thing, I found this out this morning, and I, I went to Wayne, and he's like, yeah, I knew that, whatever. <laughs> but before that, the congressman that was in this seat was a steel worker that worked at J&L Steel. So we had a personal reason to want to win back this seat for the last 20 <coughs> years, okay? last 25 years. Um, and so Wayne, you know, very modestly, he, he might say this himself because he likes to brag sometimes, but Wayne came to the organization, came to the Steelworkers Union and said, we need to endorse Kathy Dahlkemper and we need to invest all of our chips in this race because we've got a real chance. What we started doing, though, in the congressional district, we've got how many members in the, in the congressional district, Wayne? Uh, I think somewhere around 12,000. Somewhere around 12,000. And falling. And falling, because of Phil English. What we started to do, though, is call members and do internal polling in all of the different counties within that congressional district, okay? We started doing calls into Butler County, into Mercer, into Erie. Erie County is where Kathy's from, all right? We saw that her greatest strength was in her hometown, in her home county of, of Erie County. Um, but we found that her weakness was in Butler, 
And I'm just reiterating what, what Wayne has said before. I'll maybe speak more eloquently about it. Um, but we did, we did this polling in all of these different counties. We passed it on to Wayne, who was our field coordinator in Pennsylvania. Wayne created the strategy saying this is what we needed to do. So he started doing earned media events in Mercer County. We, we basically salted all of uh, Erie County to strengthen and solidify our base there. And then in Butler County, we had a project, a program called Hot Idol, which was operated out of headquarters here, here in, you know, where you are right now. And we were leafleting all of our plant sites, um, getting out the word about Kathy, trying to move that number up um, so that we could, if, even if we didn't win Butler County, if we just <coughs> moved our number up in Butler, it could offset you know, the, the, the disparity in other, in other areas. So we did blanket leaflets across Butler, uh, worked with volunteers, and as we moved toward election day, we continued to do flash polling every single day, or as often as we could, to track our progress, to see if we were improving, if we needed to just jump ship in that county or whatever county we were talking about, or if we needed to really just keep on and increase because we saw our numbers starting to bump up. And so that's how this was a machine for that congressional race. And it, you know, I'm thinking about it now. Now that we're off of the election, any issue-based campaign that, that we want to do or that any affiliate wants to do, this would be a true machine to organize on an issue. Because like I was talking earlier, um, you know, I forget, your, Tom had come to me and said about uh, losing some votes on an issue that, that he was concerned about lately, wanting to put pressure on elected officials. And like I said, if, if, if we have a phone list for that area around that congressman or congresswoman or that elected official, we can upload the list in half an hour, um, and then by the end of the day, on, by the end of the day, depending on how many phone bankers we had, how many volunteers or whatever, you will have talked to hundreds of people in that congressional district or that area and found out and put pressure um, and hopefully mobilize them to call that congressperson okay, about that issue. So now we want to use this as a structure and as a tool to organize around issues. So, can I ask a question? Sure. I must have the number um, cell phones or um, anything. I mean, most, because of our membership, union members that are predominantly over age 50, right. okay. most of it's landlines. But uh, we are moving very much toward uh, cell phones, absolutely. Uh, we had over 11,000 union members volunteer across the country this year. And we got, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but we got a very large percentage of their cell phone numbers. Right. And so now we can use that. And yeah, I mean, it's, it can be used for cell phones or for landlines. And do you target a particular time during the day in which you actually do call it? Right? Oh, oh <laughs> Wayne's going to go ahead. Go, ahead. <laughs> go, go through. Go through. Um, no, that's all right. I just want to sit up here for a second. Better, yeah. 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 I mean, since we have members all across the country, um, we had to be cognizant of time zones, of course. But then we have members that are retired. So it's best we try to focus on daytime calls to our retired okay. members. Okay. And then active members in the evenings, if we could. But the good thing about union members, oftentimes, is that even if they're an active member, they work swing shifts. So, so we could even call during the day and hit a lot, a lot of active members anyways. So, but yeah, we, we had to be aware of that. So. There are flash polls that you would do in the congressional districts. Mm -hmm. you, would you use a sample or would you use the entire population of your database? We would do a sample. Right. Yeah, I mean, we would uh, try to do our best. I'm not, by any means at this point, you know, a statistics whiz. Right. But uh, now that's... You know, we were doing oversampling. I mean, seriously, yeah. if you look at polling that's done on a nationwide, you know, I was reading. Uh, it's interesting. I was given this by my by my boss yesterday. This is a poll that was done, a nationwide poll, of 800 people, and that's representative. Yeah. Because they did. Right. Okay. And we were doing polling of our membership in a state. So that, they were doing a nationwide poll. That's millions of people. 800, okay, was a representative sample. Mm -hmm. We were doing hundreds of people to represent our membership within a state where we had 100,000 members. So we were really oversampling by, like, huge amounts. 
And now that the election is over, I'm trying to go back and learn about how we can maybe make our samples smaller and still be representative. But we were oversampling by a mile. I mean, we, we would talk to a couple hundred members in a congressional yeah. district, and that would be our poll. We called so, over 200 people just in Butler County. <laughs> do, do, you have, do you have a plot of that particular race? That sounds really interesting. I'd like to see how Well, like just odd that you may ask. Over on the board over there. <laughs> that is Butler County's results. McCain smoked Obama in Butler County. Smoked. And that's where Kathy Dahlkemper ran it, won that race. If you look at, at, it at the very end. Okay. But I, how she loses by less than two. Could you see the climb, the effect of oh, your absolutely. activity? Absolutely. Yeah, real I mean, if you go back to, if you go back to, for example, I mean, like, this right here, so, this was in the Philadelphia area, union members. And this is every single day, 16, 17, 18, 19, every single day we were doing polling. And these are hundreds of people in a congressional district or in, an, or in, a, in a city. So, I mean, we were able to do daily tracking. I mean, by the end of the election, Wayne said about Kanjorski, we had uh, Mirtha. By the end of the election, in, w in, one di in, what, in one day, we were spending an hour in each congressional district in Pennsylvania. I mean, it was ridiculous. And I could we see the major effect in something yeah. like that, particularly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you're going to see their reflection of lots of things happening. That's just going to show you the general again. trend that that's going to be a, your effect. Yeah. That'll never happen again. To what extent do you, like, call up Dahl Kemper, like, hey, you know, you're slipping. <laughs> in these few days, you should probably talk to this. Oh, constant, constant communication with Tina McGee, your campaign manager, uh, hey, mm -hmm. you know, the, the next time we're going to retain this seat, we're never going to do that again at Butler unless she resides there for the next, for the next, next two years. Crawford County is the next. I already told her she better get to work in Crawford County because she's never going to reproduce that number in Butler mm -hmm. County. Never going to reproduce that in Butler County. That is a conservative redneck district. We just got all the groups that we knew. We worked very, very closely. You're with on Did I say anything wrong? No. <laughs> Did I swear? No. <laughs> we got, we, uh, we, uh, uh, He's allied, a allied with that. the CWA in that race, and we allied with the United Auto Workers. We had uh, Working America working right next to, with us on this race. Anybody that we could, it was the number one focus of the, of the race, the open seats, more or less, the seats that, that, that weren't, didn't have the freshmen in it because that's that's the path that we started down. Protect the freshmen because the second election after you elect the freshmen is the most difficult. Once they get past that election, and we were successful in all four, it's usually they become so well funded and so ingrained in that district that you have to be actually incompetent like English was where he just fell in love with Washington, Washington and forgot about CD3. He loved the Beltway but he never did anything for his district. Pipe and tube factories closed, you know, yearly there. The job loss was so bad. The communities that had become run down and distressed. And the people just said, enough's enough. It was a great opportunity. She's the right person at the right time. Whether she's going to deliver us for us, we don't know yet. She hasn't cast the first vote. But we know she's going to be a, a damn sight better than what we had before. How local do you go? Like, only on city council, or do you just have a state? Well, in our latest effort, which we haven't even begun to to poll on yet, on the stimulus, we're going to have to because that's where the money's going to go. We're going to be going to school boards, we're going to be going to city councils, <laughs> we're going to be going to county councils, because that's where the money's coming. We're going to make sure it gets spent the right way so that the taxpayers, the citizens, are the beneficiaries and not someone that lives offshore or... And before I forget, before you all leave, this is like jumping way far ahead, but I have a sign-in sheet that if you want to put your email address down, I want to communicate with you. If you're interested, if you're in the area and you want to network, um, I also have my card. I'll put it right by the sheet. So feel free to take that, but also put your name and your email so that I can have that. And so other questions, though. I'm yes. advocating for uh, 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 John Conyers to kind of reintroduce uh, HR 676 in the upcoming Congress. That's going to carry that same 
bill number mm -hmm. so that it's not there wouldn't no be confusion. Too confusion of the two bills and uh, and we uh, our groups realize that this is the only real solution to the health care issue nationally and so we're advocating for that and I'm wondering how uh, and I know that the steel workers nationally as well as a lot of locals the union support for HR 676 is overwhelming as compared to you know employer groups are not behind it yet uh, you know etc so which is uh, which is can you what is HR 676 it is, is the uh, well actually it's it's the uh, US uh, it'll be renamed US uh, uh, National Health Care Medicare Used for everybody Pardon me? Like the Medicare for everybody. Well, it's Medicare for it's an it's an expanded and improved Medicare for all, and it, it expanded meaning expanded to everybody, everybody in, nobody out, uh, and improved means no more uh, copays, deductibles, etc. It's a, it's a total comprehensive health care care bill. If your doctor says you need it, you get it. It's it'll save industry it'll save local governments millions and millions and billions of dollars the uh, the administrative costs for medicare is like two to three percent versus uh, 25 to 30 some percent for the, the private health care systems the private health care systems are gatekeepers they try not to cover you they because they're a profit oriented organizations and so uh H.R. 676 is the way to go. Uh, it's, it makes health care a right for every citizen, et cetera, et cetera. So how can this, that, I think this is fantastic, how can this help us? How can, what do we need to do to, what do we have to come up with the names, the, the, the numbers, or what? Well, yeah, I mean, now that we have, you know, in terms of like that for anybody who's a group, that's, you know, working on a progressive issue uh, that we might be personally invested in or, 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 or do care deeply about. You know, we want to open this up so that it can be your campaign, so that you can use this call center and just do the work through us and, you know, use it to your benefit. And, you know, where there's an issue or a campaign that we can partner together, if you have volunteers locally that you want to bring in and use this call center, you have lists, We'll set up the campaign, and um, I mean, this is absolutely th the way that it worked during the election cycle for us. We want to share it. We want to use it as a way to build alliances, to um, to strengthen, you know, groups that that have the same concerns. So, absolutely. I mean, we should talk, and uh, you know, if you have people, I don't know, are you local? Are you? Well, uh, I'm but I know there's some single payer people in the Pittsburgh area. I know. Yeah. You know, um, this is uh, uh, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, coalition for, si for yep. single payer health care, yep. and it's based in Pittsburgh. Uh, I just yep. happen to be a Butler County representative yep. for that organization. But, so. so yeah, I mean, yeah. we should definitely talk. And what's and the clearinghouse for for issues or campaigns or whatever? How how do you guys decide? <laughs> That's a good like, question. I mean, I can see if you're like totally against it, obviously not, or if you're totally for it, obviously so. Yeah, what I mean, if you guys you know. just don't really care and you're offering it as a service or whatever? Well, I don't How know. How does this that's happen? A, How does it play out? Sure, and that's the thing. I mean, we're at the point now where this is the first first time that this is a possibility because everything here is functioning, and you know we have the capacity to offer it up. So um, I don't really have a rule of thumb. This is how we determine who we work with, but. You know, I would say if you have an idea, you know, if you're here, you can if, you, if, if you're here, you're probably, you know, in our network. Um, so, so I don't, I don't really foresee any issue there, but, uh, you know, we should talk about it and, you know, I don't know what you have in mind, but. I was just but, trying yeah, to, I mean, it's, the, the whole thing on how, to, how does somebody approach and what kinds of things and then what we bring, we get our own volunteers to command the phone. That helps um, out tremendously. So if it's like issue advocacy, yeah. kind of oriented, and um, like asking a congressman to support a certain bill, mm -hmm. or um, motivating, mobilizing your constituent, uh, your membership, that kind of stuff. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, right now, now that the election's over and we've got a lot of downtime in here, mm -hmm. um, 
we are working with Working America, who is an affiliate of the AFL-CIO, and they're actually going to be using this center for some phone canvassing, first time trying it, because they've been going outside and paying corporate vendors right. tens of thousands of dollars to do phone canvassing, mm -hmm. and they don't get a personal relationship with them. Mm -hmm. They'll get stale reports back, no real you know, personal relationship, but here, you know, they're going to be able to come in and they're going to use the dialer. Um, they're a partner, so I mean, we work with them regularly anyways, but they're going to use it for phone canvassing. They're also going to, for the first time, see if they can do fundraising from this amongst their own membership. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to learn from that experience. We're going to, uh, Jen Jannon, who's a terrific, uh, <coughs> extremely enth enthusiastic young professional working with Working Marriage, she's their, their field coordinator. Um, I want to learn from her. Mm -hmm. I, you know, now that we've got this up and functioning, I want to learn from her how they use the, this, this system for fundraising and for membership development um, because we used it mostly for educational mm -hmm. and voter mobilization. Um, two weeks ago, we had our strategic campaigns pr uh, department come down. Strategic campaigns, they, they do a lot of lobbying, a lot of very, uh, very focused actions. They are right now, right now going through an international paper bargaining. Um, paper is one of the sectors that Steelworkers Union represents. And they had an upcoming conference call with all of their local union presidents across the country in paper. Over a hundred local union presidents, okay? Now to go through and do um, calls to over 130 local union presidents would have taken um, lit literally a couple days for eight staff members to do, to do notes, to do the phone calls, to hand dial them, to call them back. We uploaded the file in here, and, and in just two or three hours work, the, they had called all of their international paper presidents and set up a conference call the week, the week following that they were going to talk about their, their, their ongoing negotiations. So on a very small campaign, perfect example, we used it. and so the, so the software would whittle the list down yep. and so forth if yep. you got contact. Who, and it took them. in the South Hills? <coughs> who's your representative, state rep in the South Hills? Matt Smith. So like maybe one of your campaigns could be like first pull your members, like like um your database that you got from right. Obama. Pull right. your members. Maybe one one project could be pull your members and see what issues are important to right. them. Right, exactly. And then see what legislation Matt Smith has been doing. Right. And um, see how they line <coughs> up with your members. And and then start making Matt Smith accountable. And that could you could take sure. your group mesh to an even um, d a different level. So like you keep your group in line and, and mobilize your group and Great idea. yeah. So yeah, I mean, you take it to uh, a different level. What we're going to be doing around this this stimulus package, this economic recovery package that's coming down. Um, we're working on a resolution and we're pro probably going to do a push one, you know, signature. Just like the petition that I talked about with the Employer Free Choice Act, that's going to go out to all of our members. First, that's going to be going to be one way that we're outreaching. But we've got coordinators all across the country that are going to be working in our our areas of most membership density. So it's going to be you know the leaflet program on the ground. We're going to have the petition signing that's going to go out from a robocall. But all of our coordinators are going to, going to be working in their areas to get uh, you know legislators signed on to get different groups signed on to. Um, the economic <coughs> renewal <coughs> proposal that the steelworkers has put forth, um, and 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 then at the end, you know, we can use it this this phone bank for all these different different apparatus. If we have an area that we know has asked for X amount of money in the stimulus package and they're not getting it because of a congressman, then we will move our operation to make calls to our mem to our members in that district, just like just like you were saying to help put pressure on that candidate. Mm -hmm. And we will have already had all these petitions, all these postcards signed, to hopefully have something to hand them and say, look at what you're, what you're not doing and please stand up for us. So it's all about, you know, we've got to think about how we can use it, so. And then, um, you know, the United Sealed Workers would also be building alliances with all these smaller groups yep. as well. Is, um, is the teachers union um, mobilized in the same way with the call center? With we, uh, the AFT was actually one of the unions that had 
in the last month before the election, uh, there were union members from the UAW, from painters, from teachers, from SEIU. There were people going in and out of here from all different unions. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we were, in the last days of the election, we, we were rolled into the AFL-CIO's program, and all different union members were in the lists that we were calling. It wasn't just steel workers. Oh, wow. So we were working all together, and we were calling from this one call center every union member in a congressional district, whether they were a painter, whether they were a steel worker, whether they were a mine worker. So yeah, I mean, the teachers, um, I forget his name. Madden? Oh. I think his name, last name was... Torka? I can't remember his name. But, um, oh no, he was from another state, that's why. John hey. Tark is local. Okay. But they had, I think, seven release te teachers that were on release mm -hmm. for the political cycle that mm -hmm. had come in and do done phone banking every single day. So, yeah, they were kind of in the Are you a teacher? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I work for a yeah. nonprofit, but I'm working in the education sector, so. Okay. What nonprofit? A plus schools. Sounds familiar, but. Yeah, it's, cool. um, it's part of the like, public education network. Mm -hmm. So there are several organizations like mine that are associated with different school districts across the country. And so we focus mainly on different schools. So my interest, of course, is you know, school board and local politics, um, more so than national. I mean, this is important as well in state, but um, yeah. And it really depends on too. The, the governor has a whole lot of influence on, over education, more so than a lot of other states. So that's definitely an interest as well. What time does this go to? Two? Two. OK, so we probably should wrap it up here soon. Um, any other questions? Okay. It's just, a, not just an example to see if this is a legit way because, you know, we continue to talk about contacting membership. Right? But so let's say that, um, let's say our members in, in, in our volunteer organization, like, we say there's 50 of them, like, want to support his group for uh, single parent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I get the voter list public voter list mm -hmm. for people in South Hills, okay? And we get 50 members of our organization that wanted to, that are willing to, over a couple of days or whatever, do some phone banking. That's a legitimate sort of use of the... I think if it's an issue-based campaign like that, that's not speaking particularly about a candidate saying, go and vote for this candidate, right. that it's totally legitimate. And, and, you know, basically we would just have to clear it with, of course, a lawyer maybe. But uh, because we haven't done that yet, um, we're now at the point where we want to do that. And as soon as we have some people that are interested in it, we're going to want to Because a lot of us that. don't have these organizations yeah. that are so mm -hmm. big that you need a freaking phone bank to contact yeah. them. Yep. And that's the thing. I know that um, SEIU, they have a phone bank in, in Ohio that they have leased out to other groups. And we want to do, do basically the same thing. We want to be able to offer this because we're not always using it. I mean, right now we've got 30 empty stations. So... Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we're ready to move forward and to, to say, yeah, if you want to use it, by all means. Thanks, um, thanks Eric. This is great. Sure. And it's fantastic. And, and actually, uh, I'm one of the ones leading another session at the next time. Oh, did and, sign? and um no. much of what he is saying will dovetail with what I'll be delivering, too. Hard. I, um, I have got an auto dialer, and some of the things that I think I could do would be like a baby step ramping up to where the big boys fly. And what I should say is... Uh, after the election, we've gone back to our members in over a dozen states, and we've done a 15-question survey about how they've been in impacted by the economy. And that, and that survey is comprised of both multiple choice answers, you know, from a, from a list of, uh, of options, but also open-ended questions that is data collection. You know, they put in a paragraph where the agent types in a paragraph. To do a survey like that, it would have cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars hundreds of thousands of dollars to do an, through an outside <coughs> intermediary or organization. But we've done it all internally, and that's something that you, know, that you can do too. So it's been a great tool that way too, outside of an election cycle, to just better understand our members, um, both how they can be served better by the union, and, both how to, and also how they've been affected by this crumbling economy. So that's basically it. Fabulous. Sure.